One of the things that I really love about computer-guided implant surgery is the fact that it allows me to push the treatment planning envelope to its boundaries. I can do that because the software allows me to do prosthetically driven implant planning, which means that I start with my final result and work backwards from there. I can then visualize where the implants need to be and then use that information in order to develop my implant surgical sites uh, so that the implants are in exactly the right spot for where they need to be. Uh, this is a great case to illustrate that. This is uh, Keith. He's a 58-year-old uh, gentleman who came in to see me uh, because of a bridge uh, between his lateral incisors, maxillary lateral incisors, that was failing. So he had a bridge from 7 to 10 and the two abutment teeth were failing. Uh, and he needed to have these teeth removed, and we discussed implants. His medical history is uh, significant for hypertension, for which he's on uh, some Kozar, clonidine, and hydrochlorothiazide. And other than that, he's fairly healthy, and he's not allergic to any medications at all. Looking at the periapical radiographs that his dentist sent us, you can see that uh, the bridge has been removed, and there is uh, basically no tooth structure above the gingival margins. Uh, tooth number seven, uh, has a slightly widened periodontal ligament space, uh, but tooth number 10 has a fairly good sized periapical radiolucency, which we can uh, see a little bit more clearly on our cone beam CT scan. When Keith came in to see me for his implant consultation, he had a provisional bridge in place that his dentist made for him. And so what we did is we did the scan with a scanning template with a bite index material called Futar Scan uh, in the template. And so the provisional bridge made indentations in that impression material, which I'm going to then use for planning uh, the positioning of my implants because they're going to be based on his existing provisional bridge, which was actually quite aesthetic and functional. And so this bridge mimics his final implant supported prosthesis that his dentist was planning once the implants have integrated. So let's take a closer look at our treatment plan. We're going to be using BioHorizons Tapered Internal Plus implants. And for the lateral incisor positions, they're going to be 3.8 millimeters in diameter and 15 millimeters in length. And for the central incisors, the fixtures are 4.6 millimeters in diameter and 12 millimeters in length. The tapered internal plus line uses platform switching to attach to the abutment. And in this patient's case, it's his dentist's preference to use cement retained uh, restorations. And so as you can see, uh, the implants themselves are aligned with the incisal edge of all four of the uh, teeth that are going to be in the uh, uh, comprise the final prosthesis. And you look at the uh, uh, cross sections and you can see that there's definitely an adequate amount of vertical height of bone in order to place the implants. We've got 15 millimeters, 15 millimeter implants at the lateral incisors and 12 millimeters for the central incisors. But also what you can see is that if you look at the cross sectional width of the ridge that we have less than two millimeters on the facial and less than two millimeters on the palatal in many of the areas around where we need to place these implants. So to review, we've got a failing bridge from 7 to 10 with a periapical lesion on tooth number 10. Uh, our cone beam CT uh, that we took for evaluation of our implant placement for four implants shows that we have enough height of the ridge, but we're deficient in width uh, uh, where most of the implants are going to be placed. So our plan then is going to be extraction of teeth 7 and 10 and then at the same time we're going to do a ridge expansion from the 7 to 10 area and then place four implants at 7, 8, 9, and 10 using the BioHorizons guided implant surgical kit. I'm going to start the patient on my standard preoperative regimen which is Paradex rinse twice per day and amoxicillin 875 milligrams twice per day. Both started two days before. The amoxicillin will continue for a total of six days, which will be three days post-op, and the Paradex rinse will go for approximately two weeks post-op. We begin by making a sulcular incision, uh, just lateral to uh, teeth number seven and 10 in the interdental papilla, carry that across the alveolar ridge uh, in midline of the crest, and lay a full thickness mucoperiosteal flap beginning between teeth number six and seven and carrying that over between uh, teeth numbers 10 and 11. Then using a spade proximator, we're going to perform atraumatic extraction of tooth number 11 and tooth number seven. You can see here how the proximator is, uh, is luxating the tooth and expanding the alveolus, so then we can easily take it uh, with a uh, 
forceps and remove it. We're again then going to cure it out the socket, remove any granulation tissue or any periapical lesions, and then irrigate thoroughly. To prepare the ridge, we're going to use the piezo surgery unit, uh, which uh, is a, an ultrasonic saw that will vibrate and uh, uh, cut hard tissue and spare soft tissue in order to split the alveolar crest. So we're going to split the alveolar crest uh, approximately a, a centimeter to a centimeter and a half deep uh, using the piezo surgery tip. This is a, a small saw tip that we're going to use uh, to split the ridge. And then to spread the ridge, we're going to use a uh, spreading chisel, uh, both a flat and a rounded chisel, and basically green stick the uh, alveolar, uh, buccal alveolar cortex and the palatal alveolar cortex uh, out laterally. So as you can see, we're gaining approximately three to four millimeters of width of the alveolar ridge, uh, mostly on the buccal, but uh, a bit on the palatal also. Then we're going to thoroughly irrigate, and then we're ready to prepare the osteotomy sites with the BioHorizons guided surgical kit. In contrast to a standard implant surgical kit, which only has drills, uh, with a guided kit, we have drills as well as drill guides. And the drill guides act as a sleeve within a sleeve that's placed into a master guide sleeve, which controls the position, the angulation, and the depth of every osteotomy drill, as well as the implant when it's placed through the surgical guide. I was personally involved in the development of this kit, and we tried to make it uh, to be probably the best kit on the market. And one of the ways we did it is we tried to keep the kit and the instruments as simple as we possibly can. So compared to the uh, other competitive guided surgery kits, there's a significantly reduced number of components. We also color coded all the components all the way from the osteotomy drills and the drill sleeves to the implants. So the 3.0 and 3.8 millimeter implants are yellow in color. The 4.6 millimeter diameter is all coated in green and the 5.8 millimeter diameter implant and all the drilling components are blue. The master cylinder that is used for the osteotomy preparation and the implant placement controls the position and angulation of each osteotomy, and its vertical placement in the surgical guide is what controls the depth of each drill and also the depth of the implant placement. When the surgical guide is fabricated, the master cylinder is positioned by the lab either two millimeters, three millimeters, four and a half, or five and a half millimeters above the uh, top of the implant. And uh, depending on what length of drill is used, a 17, 21, 24, or 28 millimeter drill, that determines how deep the osteotomy is created. And then the actual depth of fixture placement is controlled using the implant drivers that have corresponding stop positions, one, two, three, and four, which physically stops the implant placement at the correct depth. Luckily, this is not something that the clinician has to calculate on their own. When the surgical guide is manufactured and delivered to the surgeon, it includes uh, in the package a surgical protocol, which includes for each osteotomy site, for each implant position, essentially a recipe that tells you what drill length to use for each site uh, and which drill guides are used to get the implant osteotomy site to the proper depth and the proper diameter. It also specifies for each site the implant driver to be used to deliver the implant as well as the depth stop position at each osteotomy site. And as you can see here, each set of instruments for each site is color coded based on the implant fixture diameter. So now that we've surgically expanded our ridge to have adequate width, we're going to go ahead and place the implant. So we're going to place our surgical guide in place. This has been uh, created from our uh, electronic digital uh, treatment plan. We're going to start with our 7 and 10 uh, implant osteotomy sites with a 2-0 twist drill. Uh, we're going to go to 28 millimeters in depth as per our recipe or drilling protocol. And we're going to go all the way to the depth, all the way to that stop using lots of irrigation, light pressure, and short strokes in order to get lots of irrigation in and get the uh, bone debris out. Uh, then we're going to go to the second drill, which is a 2.5 millimeter diameter. We're going to bring down the drilling speed from about 800 to about 650 RPM. And again, light pressure, short strokes at both the 7 and 10 positions. And then we're going to do the third and final osteotomy 
with a 3.2 millimeter drill. And again, we're gonna slow down the drill speed as we increase the diameter of the drill. And we're gonna go all the way to depth and we're gonna be preparing our, this is our final osteotomy for our 3.5 millimeter implant, uh, 3.5 millimeter diameter implants. And then we're gonna prepare the number eight and nine sites. We're gonna start again with a 2.0 twist drill. Uh, go all the way to depth. Again, this is gonna be 28 millimeters in length, uh, or the drill length per our protocol. Uh, again, short, uh, light strokes going all the way to depth. Now what we're going to do normally the next drill in sequence is a 2.5 millimeter but we're going to skip that and go directly to the 3.2. Uh, we can do that because we're in the maxilla, it's relatively porous bone, and because we've actually split the ridge which decreases the density in the medullary portion. So after our second osteotomy, we're going to skip to our final osteotomy for our 4.5 millimeter implant, which is a 4.1. Again, we're going to skip the uh, intervening 3.7 millimeter diameter osteotomy drill in this instance. Again, light pressure, short strokes, lots of irrigation, and now our sites are prepared. We're going to remove our surgical guide and thoroughly irrigate the site, make sure that there's no bone debris left, and then we can go ahead and place our implant fixtures. So we've got our implant drivers that you see on the right. These are latch angle drivers that go into the handpiece directly. They are color coded based on the implant diameter and implant line. These are the tapered internal implants. The tapered internal plus would have uh, implant drivers with two color bands. Uh, what you see on the left is the depth stop, which goes into one of the four stop position slots or slot, stop position grooves on the driver, as you can see in the illustration on the left side. And this is how the depth of implant placement is controlled so the implants are not seated too deeply. In addition to the metal depth stop tool, there's also a disposable depth stop ring that can be used. And this is nice because uh, it actually frees up an extra hand, either of the surgeon or of the assistant during the procedure. In this case, I'm going to use the new screw retained implant drivers, which you can see here uh, are screwed directly into the implant fixture itself. There's a knurled knob on the end that is used to uh, remove it after the implant's placed. And the square area just below is where the handpiece adapter attaches uh, in order to uh, deliver the implant. This is my preferred choice of implant driver to use when I'm doing an extraction with an immediate implant because I can atraumatically remove this implant mount from the fixture without disturbing it at all. Or in the posterior, if I've got some limited space, I can put the implant fixture directly on the implant mount, place it uh, with a, a hemostat into the uh, master sleeve and the drill guide, and then attach the handpiece adapter to it once it's in position. For the two central incisor fixtures, we're going to be using the implant driver uh, with the yellow and green stripe. And for the 7 and 10 positions, the one with the gray and yellow stripe again, uh, as dictated by our surgical protocol. Once we've irrigated, we're going to put our surgical guide back in so we can deliver the implants through the uh, surgical guide and the master sleeves. We're going to do this with the irrigation turned on, and you can, you'll can you notice the, uh, the, the disposable depth stop ring that we have in place, and that's to help free up either my or my assistant's hand, so that's going to go all the way to depth. We're going to use the same process to place the fixtures at sites number 8, 9, and 10, and again we have the disposable uh, stop ring that is used to control the depth of implant placement, and then we remove the handpiece and use a hand wrench, hand torque wrench, in order to adjust the timing of the fixture once it's to depth. We're going to remove all the implant mounts and then place cover screws on all four of the implants and then go back and I'm going to release the periosteum off of the buccal cortex uh, as much as I can to be able to get primary closure or as close to primary closure as I can without tension. And I'm going to score the periosteum using a number 15 scalpel blade. Uh, to graft, I'm going to use Mineros uh, corticocancellus uh, graft, and then I'm going to pack that into the bony gaps uh, between the implants and uh, uh, lateral to them. Uh, compact that down in place, and then uh, make sure that I can uh, close the mucosa. I'm going to take some Memlock uh, collagen barrier, and I'm going to trim that to the anatomical shape of the area that uh, we're treating, and I'm going to tuck that under the full thickness mucoperiosteal flap on the buccal and on the palatal uh, to uh, contain and protect the graft. And then I'm going to close using 3-0 cytoplast suture 
using a combination of figure eight sutures with some interrupteds uh, along the entire ridge. So now we're completely closed, gonna make sure that everything's nice and stable. And finally, we're going to deliver the patient's stay plate and make sure that it's adjusted so that it doesn't put any pressure on our surgical site. Postoperatively, our patient's gonna continue the chlorhexidine rinse and amoxicillin until it's fully gone. He's going to stay on a soft diet for about six weeks. We'll see him the following day to adjust his stay plate and uh, instruct him to leave it out at night. Uh, his uh, sutures will be removed at two weeks post-op and then he'll be monitored uh, for about four months. And at that point, he'll be evaluated for uncovering the implants and placement of healing abutments and then eventual restoration. Here is our immediate post-op radiograph showing we've got four perfectly placed implants in the anterior maxilla. The patient returned at his two-week post-op appointment to remove sutures and this is what the tissue on the ridge looked like and at the same time we also got a cone beam scan to evaluate our implant positioning in 3D just to uh, verify accuracy of our procedure. This is a cross-sectional view of the number 10 implant, and you can see that there is nice expansion of the ridge around the fixture with an adequate amount of bone on the buccal and the palatal, and the same was true at all four fixture sites. And finally, our post-op 3D reconstruction of our cone beam data shows the accuracy and precision to which the BioHorizons guided surgical kit is used to perform guided implant surgery um, on a routine basis. And what's even more amazing is that this entire procedure was performed in less than one hour.